Hi everyone, good evening and welcome to the launch of Vertical Veg. The Vertical Veg Guide to Container Gardening by Mark Riddell Smith. I'm Mark's editor from Chelsea Green. And firstly, thank you for joining us, for logging on. Um, to let you know that we will be recording this event and it will be available after, afterwards on YouTube. Um, in a minute, Mark and Chris are going to kick off what I think will be a fascinating talk on growing and how to grow an amazing amount of fruit and veg at home. Um, they're going to talk for about 40 minutes, then there'll be time for some questions at the end. Um, so if anybody's got a question, please do put it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you want to order the book, um, in the chat, we're going to put a link and a discount code for you. And if you want to order a personalised copy, please feel free to order it via Mark, um, who can sign a copy for you. Um, and as of today, the book will be available from all the usual booksellers. Um, anyway, you can order books. And of course, I want to give a quick shout out to all the great independent bookshops out there um, if you want to order through them. Um, before we kick, before Mark and Chris kick this off, I just want to say a few words um, about Mark, because what has stood out to all of us at Chelsea Green throughout this, um, throughout working with Mark, and what made us so excited about the book in the first place, is that it's the result of 10 years of Mark growing fruit and veg in his balcony, up, his, up and down his walls, across his walls, in his front yard, in a court corridor down the side of the house. And as a balcony grower myself, I have to say, what is in this book is absolute gold dust, full of those tips and tricks that no other book will tell you, plus suggestions to get over those obstacles that are unique to these spaces, because Mark has actually lived it, he has actually done it. He has planned, plotted and troubleshot every stage of growing. There's something in this book for everyone, whether you're just starting out with a three pot herb garden on a windowsill, or to the other end, if you're a keen gardener who just wants to grow from seed, or make your own potting mix or fertilizer, or really maximize your growing as Mark has done, as you'll see in the book. Um, in his second year, Mark grew over 900 pounds worth of produce on his balcony in his pots, um, which, was, which just blew our minds. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you, Mark. Um, and throughout, I've just kind of marveled at your depth of knowledge, your care and attention. I mean, just really making sure that everything in this book was so clear, that the reader would have everything you needed to know, to understand every planting plan, every step-by-step, step, that the page design was clear, that it was beautiful, but also for reminding me throughout that growing in pots and in containers in the city is not just about producing food, but it's about creating beauty and life and flavor and community. And I remember that the book's original title was The Art and Joy of Growing Food in Small Spaces. And Mark, your joy of growing food shines through every page in all the photographs and every word of this book. So on this day of publication, I want to congratulate you on a fabulous achievement, on this fabulous, fantastic and inspiring book. And just go cheers. Congratulations, Mark. Thanks, Mina. Thank you. Over to you guys. You, you, you did a lot of the work <laughs> sorting it all out for me. So thank you very much. And very patient as well. <laughs> Absolute our pleasure. I'm going to disappear now and leave you to get on with it. I'm going to um, echo Muna's words, Mark, because um, because it's brilliant. I really congratulate you. And it's um it's quite it's quite an important thing to point out, which Muna just did there, really, is you can buy a lot of books on on container gardening and there's lots of pretty pictures and it's this whole kind of thing of of seeing something that's over there that you kind of look at um and that's really not part of your life but it's something you aspire to well this book is incredibly practical um you're a man like me we put our hands in the soil that's what we do it's about practition it's about getting out there and doing it it's not about uh aspiration it's about getting out and doing it. So I, I want to start off with the one question, really. Uh, you've obviously done this for a while. I've, obviously, I've known you a little bit as well. When you started the book, what was your square one? What was the first thing you wanted to say to people? Oh, gosh. I wanted to write it, I think. I mean, my motivation was writing it partly was because, well, there were several. One was because... When I started growing, I bought a lot of books on container gardening and on gardening, and they were really helpful. A lot of them, I learned so much from them, but also they didn't a lot. They didn't seem to ask answer a lot of the questions, the specific questions that 
I had. So things like I had a sort of shady balcony and we, it was hard to find out which crops grew would grow well on the shady thing or we didn't really appreciate that you know when a book would say replace your compost every year we didn't really appreciate but actually I had a bicycle I didn't have a car <laughs> and getting all the compost on a bicycle wasn't really going to be very easy so I think that was one motivation um another motivation was just that over the last 10 years I've had so many conversations with so many people so although it's my name on the book actually you know so much of it comes from other people that I've talked to along the way. I've talked to container growers in Democratic Democratic Republic of Congo, in Nepal, uh, in Europe, you know, all throughout different countries, Slovenia, France, and just little bits of knowledge I've picked up from them. It sort of felt like it's been a shared journey. Uh, I had so much in my head. I just felt I really just wanted to get this down um, into a book. And uh, as also the other motivation was that um, I think the thing really motivates me and inspires me about it, as well as just loving it, is all the things that Muna talked about, how it can um, build community, improve the food you eat, <laughs> all those things, yeah. Well, I think we'll definitely get on to the community theme because I know that's a strong theme and it's actually something um, gardeners or real gardeners always, we love that point of contact, but I quite like the detail in the book. Well, I quite like it. it's an understatement. Um, I think that it's full of detail, practical detail. And it starts from square one. It starts from having a few pots or some microgreens. Or, and so it, for me, there's, there's quite a lot you can delve into. But if you were starting off square one, you would do, say, microgreens. Or how would you manage your space to begin with? Yeah, well, I, I think that's a really important thing to say. So starting off, there's a lot of information in the book, and I, I, I really don't want anyone to feel overwhelmed by that. There's a lot of information. Because what I also say in the book is that actually the basics are really simple. <laughs> um, and I really, I try and sort of, I've got some keeping simple bits because actually all you, to begin with, you know, as long as you use a sort of reasonable sized pot and you get some good compost and you put it in enough sun and you remember to water it, that you, you, you're 90% of the way there <laughs> already. Um, and, and then, yeah, just, you know, choosing some easy things uh, to grow. I mean, grow anything, anything you get really excited by. I wouldn't want to deter you and just don't worry if it doesn't work. Um, but it probably will if you put just a little bit of research into what it needs. But things like... Um, yeah, these, these microgreens here are, are great to start with because, I mean, I just said these two weeks ago and already I've got um, significant harvest here and also they're almost almost free to grow. I mean, all these, this, this, this tray here, um, I've got, it's hard to see actually in the light, sorry, but the sunflower shoots, there's fenugreek, there's coriander and there's uh, peas. And these are all grown from just... Uh, seeds from a store, so dried peas from a supermarket, fenugreek from a spy shop. The sunflower seeds are actually uh, bird food. <laughs> so you buy the packing food, you just sow them straight. So that's a good. So you just sow them straight into a tray, quite yeah. densely, and they'll do on a windowsill or yeah. Because there's obviously um, balcony growing. You can expand it, or you can keep it um, simple. So so you can do both of those, can't you? That so you can yeah. have a window ledge, or you can have yeah. a. I was. Yeah, you can have both, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you actually I mean, the thing about, I mean, as I said, there's lots of different things, and microgreens are only one thing. I mean, they're quite, uh, they're very easy, but they're quite labour-intensive to keep sowing them, but they're great to start off with. So, you know, these would be great to start off with. But then there's things like the sort of herbs like um, thyme and rosemary, which you basically just plant them once and then you leave them and then they keep producing leaves for, for well, for years and years. Um, so it's just different different ways of of doing it. But these microgreens, I mean, one of the benefits of them, I mean, I don't know if you can tell how much food there is on this. So this is just a yeah, tray. Yeah, yeah. And on this tray, I reckon I've probably got, if I went to buy them, say salad packs from a supermarket, particularly when they, some of them, this coriander is quite small still because it takes a long time to come up. But I've probably got five, ten bags of salad from a supermarket on that one tray. And you but just graze do, them, Mark. Do you just graze them? Do you just um, yeah? Well, do different. I mean, you can make a whole salad with them, the pea shoots and things. Or the other thing to make them go a long way is if you buy like a lettuce from a supermarket, and then add you know a handful of leaves to it, you've suddenly to converted a simple lettuce 
into something, you know, if you add some coriander and some pea shoots and some sunflower shoots, you've you've suddenly converted it into a gourmet a gourmet salad. Oh, it's, it's brilliant. Isn't it? That's just the windowsill. But looking at the book, which is um, what I find fascinating about it, is you obviously look at your space. You have to manage that space quite well, don't you? It's very productive. So you're moving stuff around the crops all the time. And that's cyclical. You look at seasons. or So it's quite important to manage a small space, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And to plot it out. And partly it's sort of trial and error, working out um, what goes where and where the sun is and making sure if you're growing runner beans, for example, that they don't, they obviously form a tall tower, which is lovely and may go up into the sun, which is really useful. Um, but just remembering that they will also cast shade. So you don't want to put something, a sun loving plant behind a tower of, of runner beans. But I remember actually something you said to me, uh, which I've been subsequently said to other people is, you know, in a small space, thinking of your space as a cube, is really helpful in sort of three dimensions um, because actually when you look up you can often see spaces where you can put things so either you can have climbers going up into them or you can hanging baskets uh, to make the most of the space or uh, something I really like are growing ladders which are very simple just like a ladder I like simple things actually uh, a good. ladder to start the wall <laughs> and suddenly from a space where you only have one or two pots suddenly you can have like five levels of pots um, and the other thing you'll find in some of very very common in small spaces in urban spaces is that as you go higher you get more sun because often lower down walls or trees or whatever shade it and as you go up you get more sun so ladders or shelves on the wall are very good for um, moving plants into into more light and I had a fun experience actually on a balcony because I <laughs> had I've got a rather one of the things about this growing is if you really get into it, you can find that you just keep buying pots. And I'm sure lots of people listening to this will have found that experience. And sometimes you have to, I mean, the good thing about them is you can take pots away as well as adding them. But anyway, I got to the point, I had got very carried away at this point. And so there was actually nowhere left to sit on the balcony. And uh, my wife, Helen, very kindly pointed this out to me. Uh, and I thought, well, I'm not getting rid of the um, pots on the balcony. So I actually built a shelf above the door <laughs> to put them on. But it was amazing the difference it made because the shelf above the door, they got so much light, more light up there. So they were really struggling on the base of the balcony. But as soon as they're on the shelf, they did really well. So I sort of accidentally learned a lesson there. But higher <laughs> up, often you get a lot more, a lot more sun. So certainly, obviously, from the book as well, what I love about it is every... Every opportunity counts, doesn't it? So it, it might be your home. You might not have a garden or you might have a small garden or you might have, but you use all those opportunities to grow, all those opportunities to grow. I wonder your, I know the book has got some brilliant detail in this, um, but let's start with composts. What you're um, thinking about, how do you do compost? Because compost is a, is a bit of a spiky um, subject because you can go down to a, a garden centre and buy a load of it for 10 quid, that won't do the job you want to do. So there's definitely rules to composting, isn't there? And compost. Do you do you mean um, buying compost? As in, as in what you put in your pot, as what you're growing, yeah. So, okay. so yeah, yeah. So so what I'll actually grow in, I guess, um, for most people, you know, in small spaces, it's not really practical to make all your own compost. I think you can, um, you know, you might be able to have, well, I recommend if you, if you don't mind worms, um, some people have phobia, but if you don't mind worms and getting a wormery is a brilliant way of making compost to keep the pots topped up with fertility. And maybe we could talk about wormeries in a moment, but yeah, I, I do actually think it's worth particularly to start off with investing in good quality um, compost. You want peat free, multi-purpose compost. Um, and the reason for that is it does really make a difference and which every year do a survey um, and there's a brilliant picture in their, in their magazine where they trial sort of 30 different sorts of composts and there's a picture of the best performing compost and the worst performing compost so they grow the same plants and all the compost and the difference mm. is just like massive um, which just shows that it's just really worth trying to get good good so it's compost. worth investing in decent compost to begin with in your pots and obviously um 
there's a difference between a, a seed sowing compost and a compost you're potting into or and you cover all this in the book and, yeah, I, just, and I don't uh, think you need to worry about I mean I recommend people don't really I mean you know I, I know professional gardeners use seed sowing compost but I just don't think you need to worry about it multi-purpose mm. compost I think for most vegetable growing is all you you know just keep it simple just a good one is all you need and actually I think there's a benefit of using it for seeds because they don't need transplanting so quickly so they have more there's more food in there so the seeds grow a bit stronger for longer so I would just keep it simple um there's a brand in the UK peat free one called silver grow which mm. I'm going to give a shout out for because it's generally oh, yeah, I use it as well yeah, it's yeah. It's, yeah it's really good and it, but if you can't get that and you can't get anywhere you know you want to go to a good ideally independent garden center um and ask for their advice um about what to recommend um because it really is worth I and mean, once you once you're going and you've grown some stuff successfully then by all means you know i went to aldi yesterday and bought some peat-free compost um you know it's really cheap there and oh you know i mean definitely try that as well but i do recommend just getting a bag or two of the good stuff because then you can compare it and see because it's for sort of like I sometimes talk about it as like the foundations of it's, it's, it's yeah, not very it's, sexy. No, <laughs> it's, it's but you, but you're right, it, yeah, foundation is a good word because if you yeah. get that bit right, then the rest follows, doesn't it? Exactly. And I, I mean, I'm interested in the book as well because you mentioned uh, something close to my heart, but also using a simple thing like a sieve if you're going to sow seed. That's a very big part of if you're bringing plants on, just having yeah. they have that fine, easy start to life. That's yeah. part of it as well. Yeah. Yeah, I know you mentioned it as well, and um, I think the book is so thorough on this. Just things like top dressing. So, if you have a container garden, it will do a thing called leaching, won't it? Basically, as you water it, nutrients will get washed through because it doesn't retain stuff like an open soil will. But you cover this very, very thoroughly. So, a little bit about composting in a way. You mentioned worms. Just to top dress, is that a good idea? Just to add a layer on the top to stop that happening. Yeah, so I mean, as you say, yeah, so the, the, the food plants use up the food and the nutrients. So the plants in the pots need feeding in some way. And there are lots of different ways to do it. And it's it's easy to be overwhelmed by, as well by all the different ways you can do it. But actually, the main message I would say is that feeding makes a big difference. And I've done tests where I, I fed things with lots of different things. And the biggest difference was between feeding and not feeding. So I just mm. some ways I say that people don't need to stress out about how you do it. But but as you get into it, the more ways you can do it, the more you learn about it, then the healthier and stronger plants you can grow. And a really good way is if you've got like a wormery is doing what you're saying, make some worm compost and then add like a layer of a worm compost on top of the soil every sort of uh every few months particularly hungry things like tomatoes and squash and um they really love they really love that you can actually when i first got a wormery i could actually see when i put the worm compost on the top the plants are sort of just looking healthier and stronger i mean the great thing about worm compost is that as well as adding nutrients it's absolutely full of microbial life and in the same way that humans need microbial life in their gut to break down our food. I mean, we can't live without them. It's the same in the soil, in that microbial life in the soil breaks down the food, breaks down the particles to release food for the plant. So when we add worm compost, we're adding both the food and the microbial life that the plants need to, to, to really thrive. So yeah, so top dressing as gardeners call it, adding a layer on the top is great for, um, yeah, it's great for for, for making that uh, maintain yeah. that more uh, that soil health. And then the book is so concise on that. And uh, the other thing you're um, what I love about the book is it's um, it's easy to to, to uh, say simple things like you should foliar feed your plants, whether but you really look into all of this, don't you? You really do. You've got I, I'm a big foliar feed man, but it's not maybe as simple in terms of the, the advice you're given in a general book. You kind of look into all angles it's not foliar feed doesn't just need to be seaweed does it is what i'm saying yeah well it's i mean it's i have to say that it's something i've just been you know i've dabbled with foliar feeding for for several years but i've really been getting into it for a long time so those people who who are not sure what i'm going on about what we're going on about when we say foliar feeding basically plants can absorb food in different 
ways they can absorb it through the roots but they can actually absorb it through their leaves very well and foliar beading is when literally you just put like a liquid um fertilizer like liquid seaweed into a spray bottle and you can use an old um kitchen spray bottle as long as you give it a really good clean out and then um you you, you simply just you dilute it it's very dilute don't need very strong and you spray it on the leaves and the leaves absorb the, the nutrients and it's really good for the plant because the plant doesn't have to Normally, if you feed it from the roots, it has to take the, the nutrients in from the roots and then transport it through the plant up to the leaves. Whereas when you put it on the leaves, it can take the mare, it take it in there. Um, so it's really good for the plant and it's really good for um, container growing because one of the possible risks in container growing is if you keep adding lots of liquid feed into the soil. I mean, some is good, some is very good, but if you keep adding lots of it, you can create like a bit of an imbalance um you know too many nutrients or too many of one nutrient than the other whereas if you spray it on the leaves you avoid all that problem um all that potential risk uh, and you're just giving your plants and you can see them respond i mean a really good test and this is not such an organic one but it's just a really good way of seeing how um foliar feeding works is if you buy epsom salts which are high in magnesium and you put them in a bottle put just a teaspoon in a spray bottle and then milk dilute it with water and spray it on like tomato plants you'll see the next day the leaves have gone like dark green mm. <laughs> and because magnesium is needed for um, chlorophyll in the leaves and so you can just see how the plant has absorbed that magnesium and um, is using it to um, to um, to grow stronger so as I say I do you know it, it, it can be this thing with feeding is it can be as simple as complex as you like but your suggestion of liquid feeding with seaweed um so foliar feeding with seaweed is is brilliant i mean every plant that i ever come across uh loves it once a week um oh, herbs tomatoes i mean you can see tomatoes just responding thicker stems darker green um and it's so efficient because you need so little i mean it's expensive stuff liquid seaweed but you buy a bottle if you use it as a foliar feed just it would probably last you for several years in even quite a significant container garden yeah i apologize not uh, i should have said foliar feed um, in terms of how it's done but you are i'm talking about um, seaweed extract but you have quite a few methods of it don't you there's what other foliar feeds would you recommend that are in the book that are home oh, okay right? yeah so you yeah. can yeah. pretty much use anything as a foliar feed and any liquid so People, you can put weeds in a bucket and let them soak <laughs> and uh, they'll get really smelly and then spray that on the leaves. <laughs> um, there's some really good ones actually in another book, um, Chelsea Green book. Um, I recommend everyone looks through Chelsea Green catalogue. We've got some fascinating stuff there um, by Nigel Palmer, uh, where he talks about, and I share one of his recipes actually in the book, in my book. Um, he as making lots of liquid feeds out of things you can just find in the city. So things like um, mussel shells, uh, egg shells, and that's really simple. You just dry them out and then soak them in vinegar. Um, or one I really like is the traditional way of making comfrey tea or nettle tea. Nettle tea is probably a better one to talk about because it's better and wider known. Um, is you soak the nettles in a bucket of water and you get this really stinky, horrible smelling liquid, which if you're living in a flat is pretty much unusable. And if you spill it on the carpet or whatever as you're going to water, it's really, really bad news. But he has this way of what you do with the nettles is you chop them up and you mix them with an equal volume of brown sugar, equal weight of brown sugar actually. So you don't need that much sugar for like a lot of nettles. Um, and you mix it all together, put a layer of sugar on the top, pack it down tight into a jar. And it's amazing this sort of reaction occurs. And in just like a week, you have suddenly got this sweet, lovely smelling liquid, nothing like that foul smelling stuff. Mm. Um, it's beautiful. I mean, you really almost want to drink it. I'm sure you could drink it as well. It'd probably be very good for you, but I haven't tried it. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, you can just use that as a foliar feed. Just put all you need is a teaspoon or even half a teaspoon in a, in a spray bottle, spray it on your plants and they'll love it. And uh, yeah, it's a fun, it's a fun experiment. And it doesn't smell. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a great one. It is. The smell thing's interesting because I do a bit of comfort on the balcony and uh, 
That really upset the neighbours. It really did. And uh, so you, you can experiment with it. And it, uh, the timing's quite interesting, isn't it? If you're going to foliar feed uh, and you like to, you're exactly like I like to do, I like to spray it, I don't water it on. If you do that early in the morning, your book is quite precise about this, that you, a little and often, is that the all, is your, your advice, isn't it, I think? Yeah, I think, I think probably little and often, like once a week or twice a week, something like that. But dilute, I think in general, going dilute is quite a good going more dilute and more often is a better plan right. than like thinking oh, i'll give it a real good whack <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um but yeah in general just a little little and often little and often is a good the other uh, maybe what about um seeds i know you're um quite big on heritage aren't you i know you really we both uh, associate with garden organic we're not going out and buying f1s um you're, you're very much into localized seed aren't you yeah, as much as I mean, I'm not, I'm not sort of dogmatic about any of these things. Um, yeah. Because I just think, well, you know, it's sort of, I think if you if you've got the opportunity to get seeds, then definitely get them. But if it's the difference between not growing or growing and you just got a pack of seeds. Got to to but you do you seed, you seed save you seed save as well, though, Mark. I do seed save. Yeah. yeah, I do seed save. I mean, some seed saving. Yeah. And there's some, some things like, you know, um so yeah i mean some things are really easy to save seeds from so this is like a chili here and i've been mm. saving the seeds some friends bought this chili back from south america for us and it was so delicious if it was a dried chili i thought well why don't i try and grow it and i did and that was about seven years ago and i've been just saving the seeds from it every year so some things like chilies tomatoes um beans those are really easy to save seeds from because they're self-pollinated. And I talk about this in the book. Some other things are more yeah. tricky too, but yeah, these are really, these are really great. And actually, um, this is one of my favorite microgreens. Unfortunately, you can't see the color in this light. It's absolutely fantastic. This is basically, um, it's auric, it's bright purple. I was going to get the light on well, it. Actually, I can see it's very good. It, it, it's, anyway, but this is a, uh, it produces these really pretty um, seed heads and you get like loads of, of seeds off. off, uh, off and you off recycle this. those seeds. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So that's, that, that's right. And I think as much as possible buying um, what we call open pollinated heritage seeds. I mean, people like there's some really excellent suppliers now, like you mentioned, there's the heritage seed catalog. Um, there's also people like the seed co-op which is fantastic for you. I mean, I really encourage people to try and get UK grown seeds and that's nothing to do with, you know, Brexit or anything like that. It's Saving the world that, and all that. <laughs> yeah, simply yeah, yeah. that if yeah. you have seeds grown in your climate, they're yeah, going to yeah. be better adapted to your local conditions. Um, and the seed co-op are great from that perspective. Real seeds are another place that are really good. So yeah, starting off with good quality um, seeds, and ideally open pollinated, so open pollinated ones where you can save the seeds from is definitely, definitely. definitely. And, and localised, making sure, it's interesting you say that if I go to my allotment, um, the best raw beans I've grown have come from the guy who's three plots away, who's yeah. been there 30 years. It's that, that's the kind of thing I think maybe um, the book's brilliant at, at this. In fact, that it, it, go out and speak to your local growers, speak to the people around you, which brings me to my next question really is, uh, you've got a family. How, how do they take all of this? <laughs> the fact you cover your building in edibles. Are they into the fresh food? Are they, do they embrace it? Is that, is that how it works? I think it's one of the things that's been really lovely, actually, um, is that I think it's so great for kids to... I think living in a city, uh, there's so many things about a city that are fantastic. Um, but one of the things which I think it's easy to do is like not actually have interactions with with plants and picking your own food. And, you know, you go to the supermarket, all the, all the, all the food is wrapped up in plastic bags. You can't smell it. You can't feel it. It's a very one dimensional experience where as if you're growing it, um, you get to... Um, feel the leaves you know tomato leaves have got an amazing smell you get to feel the bristles on the um on the um courgette stems and when you pod broad beans you know you get that furry skin on the inside and you also get to see the wood lice that scuttle around and 
all that sort of stuff. And I think that's great for kids. I mean, I grew up in the countryside a lot of the time, so I was really lucky to have that, but I was very really grateful to be able to give that um, to my kids. My daughter goes out there foraging. We hardly ever get any blackberries or anything because <laughs> her and the blackbird <laughs> compete. They're, they're done between, aren't they? <laughs> but but it's very, it's, that's very interesting, Sandra, that whole lot, um, using all the five senses. It's not just about yeah. growing something for food. It's the process. It's the... It's the, uh, the the germination of a seed is an amazing. Yeah, it? you're showing us the microgreens there. You know as well as me, we're both gardeners. As soon as they break the soil, you're away, aren't you? It's an experience yes. straight off, isn't it? That's quite yeah. really important. And but there's also community involved in it. So I'm pretty sure you'll be up front, um, well ahead on this on your local area with where, where you can actually then exchange a seed and advice or the, in your book, the community chapter. I really love because it's big part of being a gardener isn't it yeah and and i think it's it's it, it is really is and i think the thing which i think isn't obvious to people and wasn't obvious to me when i started is that growing at home in a small space like on a mild balcony can actually be a real community mm. um activity i mean if you're lucky enough to have a space in public view that's just amazing because as soon as you're out there gardening you'll end up talking to everybody in your local community but even if you haven't there's just so many opportunities like i mean plant we have plant swaps and things like that here um and they're just really nice because i think one of the great thing about growing um it's not unique about it but it's it's one of the few things which i think everybody is interested in food yeah everybody wants food and everybody not everybody's interested in plants but a lot of people are so you'll get people of all ages from all different ethnic backgrounds but with one common interest and we have a lot of events here where it's they're just really diverse really mixed yeah. and and really friendly and it's a really nice it's a really nice way to sort of get to meet people in your community who otherwise you might never um yeah never meet so never come across so yeah. it's an adhesive, isn't it? It's an adhesive. It kind of bonds everyone together. But you must be down. I mean, looking at the book and the and the, uh, the for me, the brilliant thing about the book is it's it's written by someone who's had their hands in the soil in a container situation. Which you know, <laughs> if you normally look at gardening programs, it's somebody in a bigger area. And but this is born out of your practical experience. So do they all come to you for advice now? Is this book going to be your bible of that whole setup? Um. You mean sort of locally when I'm out there? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Uh, there is, yeah, there's definitely some of that. I mean, more in London, because I think here people have a bit more, they seem to have more knowledge actually about growing plants. But, oh, but I still get a lot. I was just talking about being just yesterday, actually, someone was asking me where to get blueberries and blackberries from. So, you know, it's a very regular thing. And it's, it's, it's lovely. I really, I really enjoy that. Um, and I do sometimes, you know, obviously I sometimes give, you know, if I've got spare, you know, when you divide up your mint plants or whatever, which you have to do, folks, at this time of year, <laughs> top them in half if you're in pots, um, you know, if you've got a mint plant to give away. And uh, one of my neighbours loves mint, so I gave her a mint plant the other day. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just so, it gives, have so many opportunities for, yeah. Sure. See that, that adage, isn't it? If you want to keep a plant, give a bit away. It's definitely applying to your yeah. own garden. Yeah. So let's get let, the other thing I think that's really interesting as well is uh, I think we all, as a gardeners, we kind of get pulled down the road of edibles, which is obviously really important. But you're big into pollinators and a little bit of colour as well, aren't you? A little bit that I would call it potaging. You don't, <laughs> it doesn't need to all be this is my space to eat. You can mix the things together, can't you? Yeah. And I think I'm, I think I'm, I was a bit edible, edible, edible when I started off. If you can't eat it, you know, it's not worth growing. Um, and I do, I do go, I mean, a lot of the beautiful things, there's so many beautiful things which are edible. And I have, there's a whole lot of that in the book, you know, there's a lot yeah, of edible yeah. flowers, which are really nice. A lot of herbs um, have got beautiful flowers and are really great for the bees, things like lavender and sage and coriander, all those when they flower, fennel, when they flower, they're really pretty and they're really good for the bees. Things like chard and kale. I mean, you see them in France, they're like, they're really good at like creating vegetable gardens, but look really beautiful. Um, but I'm also now happy to put in, I do have the odd thing, which is just completely just a flower. <laughs> like, you know, I never would have done that a few years ago. But I think particularly, well, for two reasons, well, one for pollinators, well, three reasons, really, one for pollinators, 
one for ourselves it's really nice i mean it seems been madness to me to go and buy cut flowers which have been flown all the way from south africa or whatever when you can yeah. pick a bunch of them from your you know from your from your front yard um but also because it's a public space um i think it's really important that the space looks looks good and i think if you know i've got some bulbs in there at the moment like daffodils and things which around the apple tree and stuff which they're completely inedible and someone pointed out to me that i had to be careful about not eating it as an onion but i'm not, <laughs> not going to um uh, but yeah, it's just nice. I just think it, but 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 the color um, and 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 how it looks is also, um, you know, most of us have only got one garden, one mm. one small space, and you know, it's nice if it does everything if it looks good and. So yeah, it does. It doesn't have to be. Yeah, there's no. It's interesting. It doesn't have to be. The book is brilliant at this. It's not about one form of gardening. It's about a blend of gardening, and the book really covers that. So let's get to the. I think one of the, my favourite bits of the book are the eight steps, because what I'm really interested in is how if nobody was gardening at all and they were thinking about it and there's three million people during lockdown, apparently you suddenly buy it, started buying seeds. So this whole other generation is maybe out there. The eight steps is brilliant. Can you talk us a little bit through the eight steps? How did that, that approach come to you when you wrote the book? Yeah, well, the eight steps is sort of, um, so I've been running workshops over the last 10 years and, I suppose I've been trying to work out this sort of process of trying to work out how to teach people and really give people the, because as I said at the beginning of this of this conversation, growing is really simple on one mm. level. Um, and really those, those eight steps, so I thought, well, if you do those eight things, and I go into detail in each one of the book, but even if you do each, each of those eight things at the simplest mm. level, <laughs> um, it makes, it will make a massive difference because it's very easy when you start off to make there's a few little mistakes it's really easy to make just because you don't know but if you've got that information like if you know which crops need most need a lot of sun so there's a graphic in the book about which which crops need a lot of sun which which don't need very much sun um if you know that then you know you're not going to make that mistake it's really easy it's really simple um so yeah it was just trying to work out a way of structuring it um to make it really straightforward and easy to walk people through and if you do this you're going to be successful most of the time so it's a little bit like it's a mindset isn't it i mean I, the, the h i've raised the eight steps thing because it's kind of how i approach gardening if i go onto my balcony in the morning there's a series of things that run through my mind but the book is very good at either touching on it or going deep into it isn't it uh, you, you don't you know you can it's how far you want to push it but the eight steps they're very very simple but it kind of gets your, how much do you agree with me? The fact that, and the book I think reflects this, it is definitely, a, it's, a, it's a bonding exercise, isn't it? In gardening a little bit. So if you're growing out into your balcony to look at your plants, be they edible or be they pollinators, there's a, there's a, there's a things that run through your mind that keep those plants healthy. Is that yeah. what you were trying to, is that how you thought about it when you did the eight steps? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. It's what, yeah. If, yeah. And, and often I think, Often when plant, I mean, the eight steps I find are also quite useful. So they're things like, just so people know, they're things like um, the sun, choosing a big enough pot, spacing your plants, giving your plants enough space, um, watering regularly, uh, ensuring there's good drainage and feeding. Um, I might miss one out there. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Awesome. Um, uh, but basically, I mean, but the, 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 the other use for them is if your plants aren't happy, nine times out of ten it's because one of those uh one of those eight things is missing one of those eight things so either mm -hmm. the plant hasn't got enough sun or it hasn't got enough water or it hasn't isn't being being fed enough or the, the drainage isn't working so it can also be used as a problem solving tool as well as a tool to help you because that's what i think a lot of gardening is about it's about doing it and i would really encourage people just to get out and do it and have a go yeah. and that's one of the good things about the microgreens or the, the first projects in the book is just go and have a go um but it's sort of like um is have a go but if it, it hopefully it will work and if you follow the steps normally it will but if it doesn't work out then it's just like well working out what what happened and not really worrying about it because it you know even um even you chris and you have much more experience <laughs> as a gardener than me will know that 
however experienced you are, sometimes things just don't work. And my friends, my friends, you know, wisdom is born from error. You know that, don't you? That's a it's a brilliant <laughs> analogy for a gardener. Is wisdom is born from error. And yeah. the reason I brought up the eight steps is I relate to that. Even though, you know, this is what I do for a living. But I particularly there's lots of good things about the book. But I really enjoyed that bit because it's that kind of mindset. I get up in the morning, I've got a busy day ahead. I'm going to go and look at my plants. Let's get these processes through my mind. It'll only take me five minutes, but it might mean my garden is successful. And I think yeah. you cover that in the book really, really well. It's a credit to you. So let's do another, another thing I think is quite interesting. I deal with when I'm teaching gardening, especially to newbies, is obviously you're big on recycling. Let's look at containers. Anything can be a con container, can't it? Pretty much. Yeah, I mean, I just avoid things like... um paint thins and anything which is anything toxic but other than that yes I mean it is wonderful when you start <laughs> delving into I mean I try and stay away from Instagram and all those sorts of things these days but um if you if you get into it it's amazing all the different things people are finding to use you know beer kegs I mean it's just it's endless endless um and and that's you know baths and basins and so, so the rule is, is as long as it drains it will contain is that would that, yeah, is that a good, yeah definitely good as long as it, yeah as long as it drains and ideally you want i mean there's, there is quite a fashion on the internet you see this with very very small pots like yogurt pots and stuff like that and um, you can grow in them um and it can be fun to grow them like with kids or something but i always say to people it, you, it's much much easier if you can get something a little bit bigger because yeah. the bigger the volume of soil you've got the more water it holds, the more food it holds, and just the happier and stronger the plant is going to go. And obviously there's a trade-off, you know, between weight and size and everything like that. But trying to avoid really small things. But as long as they're like those sort of flower sellers, you know those buckets you get in um in uh, supermarkets often they like have the, the flowers in it. Yeah, when they stop they, them and they, they level them up and they put them on ladder sort of standards. Yeah, so, yeah often yeah. they sort of chuck those out and you have to drill holes in the bottom, but they're really good. And mm. I also use like a lot of those, you know, those um for supermarket veg crates actually that you that yeah. they they have holes in them, but as long as you just put like newspaper. So, so, so you would line newspaper. them, you would line them, as you're saying in the book, you line them so then they line them with could, line them with yeah. newspaper and they're brilliant because they're like a really good um so, so I think I grew nearly, I can't remember, about eight kilos of runner beans just in one of those trays wow. um, last year. Matt, I can assure you, we don't grow them down. We've got an allotment now. I'm lucky to have an allotment as well. But we don't grow them at the allotment anymore because we can grow enough. Eight kilos of runner beans is enough. In, in, like your, one, in your front garden or your back garden. Yeah, yeah. One, yeah, one container in our front garden, we've got more than enough. Um, yeah, so... And I think, you know, there are different approaches to it. And again, I'm not so dogmatic because like, if you live on like a, a very, like a new flat somewhere, there might be strict rules about how your front garden looks and you might feel that, you know, you need to buy some nice sort of containers to sort of fit in with that vibe. Um, but, but then there is the recycling route and the recycling route, I think, is, well, it's good from a recycling point of view, of course, but I think it's also quite fun to, to sort of find things and, uh, and and also try and make it look nice. So often there are ways to hide. So I've, I've got, I use those um, supermarket crates um, at the front of the house, but I've just put a bit of wood in front of them so you can't. Yeah. But well, you can, if you look in, you can see it through my okay. But from the outside, it actually looks like it's sort of like... For those who haven't seen the book yet, there's some brilliant shots of the... Uh... Of the diversity of container you've got in there, isn't there? There's, you know, that there is some brilliant shots in it, and it's yeah. a, and that kind of, to me, that embraces being a gardener because you kind of look around to see what you've got. Propagators, so I'm going to take you onto that now. Well, Matt, bit, being the so I just need to give a shout out to the people who did the illustrations in the book, and also to Claire Bowles who took the photograph or most of the photographs. She's a friend of mine who lives around the corner, and I think her pictures just. Uh, well, the top brilliant. shots yeah. are amazing, and the top yeah. shots I love because yeah. because it shows you them. But it's a difficult one. If you add ten acres of land, you can kind of play around and not. But it's small space takes management, and the, and I think the book really portrays that. So you're trying to road. Well, you're not trying. You are rotating things. So you have microgreens on the go that you harvest them regularly. Then you have beans that are that are for a certain point of the season you're very very precise in the book how you manage that small small space that must have been one of your thinking when you wrote the book i take it yeah i mean i guess there's some of it is some of the stuff is um 
is just there all the year round. So, and I have actually tried to increase the amount of stuff just because that just makes gardening a lot easier. So there's <laughs> more and more fruit in there. So there's blackberries, raspberries, chili and guavas, um, blueberries, um, and even in so, they, so small, these are all perennial plants. Basically. Yeah, these are these all are, perennial, yeah, 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 yeah. perennial plants. And um, and then there's also a whole load of herbs which have the same category. So that probably makes up maybe almost two thirds of the garden now. And I and I have got you know I've got a much bigger space than I than I used to 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 have. But I mean I, we had similar principles um, on the balcony. And then the other containers. Then yes, it is like planning to try and have them. Um, something in them um all year round but i'd like to think i'd like to say that i'm very organized and planned i'm a bit ad hoc to be honest chris um i mean i sort of know you're being a bit modest there i think are you no i am quite ad hoc i mean it's just like i'm i'm not anywhere near as organized as i'd like to be partly just because our life is always a bit chaotic and but i do we we get there you know we get there and you have a young family don't you so you're doing all this as well with all this going on and i think you understate yourself a little bit and the book is quite it's quite interesting on that. It, it, the, the, the thing I loved about it is it's what you, I think what you've tried to achieve is uh, scale is not a, a, um, is a restriction. You can get a lot into a small space and you're probably feeding yourself quite well, aren't you, out of these yeah. spaces? Yeah, no, yeah and I, I, absolutely. You can, you can really grow. And in some ways, there's a big benefit of having a small space in that I think a lot of people find uh, allotments or large gardens can be quite stressful because and in some ways my container garden here I found quite stressful because it's much bigger I sometimes think oh I wish I had a balcony still because it was like <laughs> much more kept me under control much uh, much better so if, if there are um, and you can grow the more the smaller the space more intensively um, you can grow and I also I mean I think the other thing that I've learned is that although I am someone who has enjoyed trying to grow a lot um, I met a lot, I mean, know a lot of people who actually get a huge amount out of just having a few, you know, a few pots. So it's just about finding what Or you... even some microgreens on a windowsill, which yeah. is that simple. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, or, 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 you know, I don't know, you could have 10 pots with 10 um, perennial herbs in, and they're going to look really nice. You'd be able to pick herbs pretty much every day. Mm. Really easy to look after, hardly any work at all. Um, so it's just sort of finding, you know, trying to find what is the right, you know, you want to obviously find things you will love to eat, but you want to match it up with how much time you've got um, and what you want to get out of it. And I sort of do grow everything, but I can see that there's different things for different, different people. And, and also the other thing I've noticed is that it doesn't, you know, there's a lot of very spectacularly beautiful gardens you see on things like Gardener's World. But I meet people who have gardens which are very small. I mean, to be honest, if TV cameras bought them, they wouldn't be interested at all because it yeah, just yeah. doesn't depict that. But when I talk to the people who are growing there, they get as much, they, they talk about it as enthusiastically, if not more enthusiastically than anyone you see on Gardeners World. And I think, it, I just think that there's something for people about if you're living in the middle of the city, and you know you've got concrete all round there's something about sort of nurturing life nurturing mm. plants um on whatever scale um and in some ways t- to however successfully as well yeah. well yeah, again, we, come back, that success. <laughs> we come back to um, the wisdom's bob mirror but what's really important about <laughs> to my mind and i'm being very honest with you the book i love the book for that because it it, it captures that whole thing about have a go it's a small space or it, it's you know you it's practically it's born from your experience isn't it and that's really really important and i think maybe we should sort of get as we've come to the end of this maybe think a little bit you touched on it there how how, how mentally how good it is for you how uh, your well-being is associated with it as well as your 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 eating well as all this stuff you definitely it brightens your day up doesn't it i can see when you speak about it it lifts you that's important isn't it yeah and i think that's something that lots of people find you know life can be all sorts of you know can be i I mean what is most starkly when you you know you see people who've recently moved to the country for example and having quite a challenging time here, you know, you imagine you being a refugee or something like that, and mm. then, then the start you see them start growing plants, and suddenly there's connections 
you know they, they feel connections to back to where they lived and maybe grow some things that you know I, I don't know it's just you see just in lots of people that when they start growing and also when I when I run workshops as soon as people get their hands into the soil you notice you know they were quite stressed and like in London they look smiley already really they just, yeah. and like really uppity and then they get their hands in the soil yeah, and yeah, suddenly yeah. you see them like relax and um yeah so, yeah, um, so it's not so complicated as we try to make it out is it it's a very mm -hmm. simple thing and yeah. uh, well I'll see Moon has popped up again I want yeah. to say personally what a brilliant book it is, Mark. I really, really, and I'm not saying, I know we've known each other a little while. I ain't saying that because we have of that. It's a great book. You can tap into it shallow. You can tap into it deep. It's very well researched and very well practiced. I congratulate you, my friend. I recommend it to everyone because it really does cover all the bases with, with container gardening. And uh, I couldn't think of a better man to be putting it out there, to be honest with you. And I, I hope everybody gets involved with it. I really do. Thanks, good. Thank you both. That was fascinating. Some really deep level stuff there. Um, but also the point Mark made is also it's, it's incredibly simple. Um, and we have some questions um, for you both. Um, firstly, when using a raised bed table for gardening, is it better to work directly in the wooden table box or to use plastic tubs? Um, well, you could do either i mean i guess the benefit of plastic tubs is that um you will it will it won't it will basically last for longer because you're not going to the wood wood and soil together are a combination which will rot so after like four five six years it will probably start to to rot so that would be one benefit of growing in plastic pots the other benefit would be you could sort of like divide it up a bit more so you could have one pot with one thing in one pot with another thing and it would you could take one out at a time and deal with one at a time but the advantage of filling the whole thing with soil and using it's growing directly in the wood would be that you would have a larger volume of soil which would be easier to look after um and you could probably grow slightly bigger plants and healthier plants in it um but but just with the downside that over time the wood probably won't last quite as long. Chris may have something to add to that as well. well I, was, I think with I, I, I'm into this big into this recycling thing at the moment, which I know you are, Mark. And uh, so I do use these uh, milk cartons that I just cut in half. What I do know about them is uh, just keep a little bit more eye on the water because they heat up quicker. It's true, isn't it? If you like, if you've got, I use mushroom pallets as like a mini allotment. And but they just they just dry up quicker if you don't keep it on. You need to remember the eight rules, my friend, and then that won't happen. I think <laughs> that's about the size of it, isn't it? <laughs> Bab, so this is from Marjolaine Riley. I've been making my own compost in my backyard. It won't win any medals, but during lockdown, when there was no compost to be found, it did the job, and I grow plenty of stuff. Mark, do you have any advice for small scale compost making if you can't have a wormery? I have three or four about the size of potato bags on the go. It's very ad hoc, but there are lots of critters in it, though. Hello, Marjolaine. I know Marjolaine. <laughs> um, so so you, this is, this is um, composting without a wormery. She's asking about. Um, yeah, my expertise is really with wormeries. I mean, you can try Bikashi is another system that you can use. Um, I mean, you can get those Daleks as well, some sort of container to to compost in. So that would be probably a simple way of, of doing it um, would be to get, yeah, like a sort of compost Dalek and uh, and compost um, in that. I mean, one way to speed things up as well is to sort of use a bit of, so there's something called Bakashi bran, which you mix with vegetables, uh, and then put in a pakashi bucket and it's a way of composting it's a japanese method of composting and it's very quick um but the thing about it is, is it doesn't really produce compost it produces this sort of sort of slushy stuff which you then have to <laughs> you can put it in the bottom of the pot or something and it will convert into compost but pakashi brown is quite useful because you can use it you can mix it with your vegetables and just put it on normal compost and it will actually speed up the whole process uh, marjolaine so you could you could just try that if you want it to to um if you're just using bags and you want to try and compost it 
um, a bit quicker. Uh, or if you get some nettles or comfrey or something like that, chop it up and mix it in, that also will uh, speed up the process as well. Fab. Right, from Rebecca Clark. Mark, have you tried Google culture in pots at all? It might, might work well in larger pots, perhaps. Hi, Rebecca. <laughs> uh, I've, I've tried similar things. I've tried um, what I call lasagna cart gardening, but I think it's very similar where it's basically mixing up. Um, so this is a technique where you put, you're sort of basically making compost in the bottom of a pot. So before you fill a pot with compost, you mix up things like uh, some bits of wood chip, uh, some vegetable clippings, maybe a bit of grass, whatever really you can get hold of. Um, but a mix of sort of hard woody things and softy, soft green things. And you put that in the bottom of a pot and then you fill it up with compost. And the idea is that um, that slowly breaks down in the bottom of the pot. And it is really good because it like slowly um, releases nutrients into the pot. But it also provides like a well in which uh, bacterial life and microbial life can live and thrive so I think for things like fruit trees and things like that it's really great to do um, and I know people who do it who, who do it for like other all vegetables and things as well and say it works well but I tend to just do it in the big pots um, and the other benefit of doing it is you don't need quite as much compost because if you're using a big pot you can fill the bottom couple of inches with you know bits of food waste and some uh, straw or something like that, and uh, and then and then it, and then uh, go from there. And Sally Wilkins says, "Hi, Mark. For an absolute beginner, what three vegetables would you recommend to start with? And would you start from seed or by plants? Thank you." She says. Oh, hi, Sally. Um, three vegetables to start with. Um, I don't know, does mint count as a vegetable? If it does, I would definitely grow mint first because I'd just get a supermarket mint and put it into a bigger pot. So that's the first thing I would do. Um, pea shoots as well um, are very good. I mentioned those already um, for beginners. Um, aside from that, um, runner beans are, are good because they're quite fun because you get the tall tall vegetable with the pretty flowers and they're sort of productive and you get to build a little wigwam as well so I would I maybe grow those um, and maybe some rocket which is very tasty and used in salads so my three vegetables would be runner beans rocket and either potato or tomato And from Amy Wright, congrats on the book, Mark. Um, just wondered where you get your aurac seeds from, especially in bulk from microgreens. Um, I, I saved my own. <laughs> um, I bought, I can't remember, I think originally they came from real seeds. Originally they came from real seeds. Um, but once you've got them going, as long as you've grown them in a, I'm lucky because I've got more space than I used to have. So I've got bigger containers. So I, I literally just save. Um, that's how I get lots of seeds. So it's actually a lot of microgreens. It's easy to get lots of seeds for cheaply. There's a way of doing it. Like you can buy them from use spice packets or you can buy um, sprouts. Companies that sell seeds for sprouting sell things like bags of uh, rocket, big bags of huge bags of rocket seed and things like that at very low cost. But oryx seeds, unfortunately, are one where um, you have to probably save them. You probably have to save them your, yourself. Um, but um, if if she, um, I've got a whole, I've got tons of them. So if she you sends send me her address, you send if she you sends should... me her, if she sends me her address, I'll send her. I'll you send her send, say God is the most generous people in the world. You should say, Mark, as not it like a, a a box of pea, pea dried peas, eighty pence, will give you a whole summer of pea shoots, won't it? That will it literally will. Give, it'll give you a whole yeah. and if you think about it, you'll pay 150 for a, dr yeah. a freeze-dried bag of pea shoots in a supermarket where you can yeah. spend 80p, get yourself an old mushroom pallet, bang yeah. it on the windowsill, and you're away. That's yeah. that's you know, it's that easy, isn't it? It's that yeah. easy. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Time for just a couple more questions, perhaps. But Susanna Broadbridge says we have a very windy balcony and are not able to attach anything. 
lean anything against the wall. Any top tips for creating freestanding, stable, vertical growing solutions? Um, if it's possible to create some sort of, if, if the wind has come from one direction, sometimes it's possible to create, I mean, wind is really difficult. <laughs> it's very really difficult to grow in the wind, but if it's possible to create some sort of wind break, that will really, really um, help you. And one thing I've seen, and I did actually, is if you can, if it's possible to fit like a, a reasonable size container, particularly if it's wood, what you can do is if you attach posts um, to the wooden containers, I'm talking about quite a large container here, or you, if you have several containers, put posts in and then put some windbreak, um, something to break the winds. Um, you can actually buy windbreak netting or you can use something like Hessian. Um, that will really make like a massive, uh, and that will make a massive difference. Um, there's a whole section actually on uh, on the challenges in the book. There's a whole section on the different challenges of growing in um, small spaces, and there's a whole one on there's one specifically on the wind and different ways to to deal with it. Um, but trying to create some sort of windbreak or sometimes in some spaces what you'll find is that the wind because the wind varies through the year so you get northeasterly winds generally at this time of year and southwesterly in the summer sometimes you find you only need to protect it during part of the year so on my balcony which was northwest facing i had to protect all the plants at this time of year a lot and i used to put like cloches over them or something like that but as the year progressed um, and the wind swapped round, I didn't really have that much problem from the wind. So, I mean, to observe where it's coming from um, and if it always comes from the same direction and see if there's something you can do to, um, to, um, to reduce it. Fab. Um, right, I'm squeezing two final questions. Rasmus J Jensen Jensen, should one be careful with plastic pots in terms of the chemicals the plants could uptake? I think the advice is that as long as you use food safe plastics, there's lots of different plastics. And if you Google food safe plastics, you'll come up with a list. I always forget their names. But as long as you use food safe plastics, then um, as far as we know, it's safe um, to grow in them. And I mean, one of the things I say in the book is that, it, I mean, this is a really complicated subject because, you know, even if plastics do release something into the soil, the soil is microbially active and there's a good chance that quite a lot of it will be broken down into something safe. There's also a good chance that it won't actually be taken up by the plant. So I'm not saying there's not any risk, but I think, as far as we know, and I've never heard of any issues anywhere of it being a problem, um, but it's also something that, you know, I mean, this is, the thing about this area of gardening, which I would love to see is more really good research being done on it and a paper to come out and someone to say, <laughs> we've really studied this in detail and we can completely categorically say, but That's it's your next book, Mark. <laughs> um, Yeah, but, but. I mean, as far as I know, thousands of people all over the world are going in plastic pots, and I haven't heard yet of anybody having a problem with it. I, I am, I have all my balconies plastic, and it's all stuff I've rescued from gardening jobs over the years. And it's um, it, in plastic is a, sometimes an unfair nemesis, isn't it, Mark? We actually, as long as you're recycling it and using it, I think it's uh, it's it's better than throwing it away, isn't it? I don't, I've never had any trouble with uh, it. Um, well, the trouble with the, the trouble with things like particularly like on a balcony or something is that the options are i mean you know i'm lucky where i am because actually i could have terracotta pots if i wanted to because i don't have to lift them up anywhere and the weight doesn't matter so much but it's hard to have terracotta pots on a, a small balcony and plastic is great because it's really light and it's really strong and you can get it in almost any size you want to wood is lovely to grow in but it's really heavy and it rots as we you know already mentioned so you know as you know as i said in the book there's no perfect material um but plastic is very handy and convenient and as you say chris you can often use recycled plastic so you're not adding to the plastic mountain that is good to know um final question hillary kalmbach 
How do you manage watering both on a daily or weekly basis? And if you need to travel? Yes. So again, there's a whole section in the book about how to make watering easier, because I think that is a really big, I mean, this is the big issue really about container gardening is that, um, you know, one of the things we haven't got onto actually this evening is that how watering is important, not just to um, keep plants alive, but actually also to keep them healthy. And quite often when gardens, container gardens get bad pest problems, quite often the problem isn't about pests really being in the air, it's the fact that the plants are stressed because they haven't had enough water. So regular watering is really critical. So but that doesn't really answer the question. Um, so there's various techniques really. One of them I rely on a lot, which is ask the neighbor. Um, and uh, that is very effective and it's good for building relationships with neighbors, but it can also go the other way, of course, if you ask them too much and might have got a lot of <laughs> containers to walk. The other is ask the um, father-in-law, that's also quite effective. Um, but there are other ways. I mean, I have got an automatic watering system um you know one of these drippers and and that is a, that is an option um there's other options as well like um getting the only thing about it is not 100 percent reliable watering by hand is much more reliable because dripper systems they can get they can get leaks they can get blocked um but but that, that is an option the other thing is you can get water reservoirs um contains with water reservoirs and most of them still need topping up fairly regularly, but there are some. So if, for example, you know you travel a lot and you know you haven't got a father-in-law or a neighbor who will come and water it, and you love growing, say, tomatoes, um, there's something called the Quad Grow, which is made by a British company called Greenhouse Sensation, which has got like a, I can't remember how many liters, but it's like 80 liters or something water reservoir. And that is enough to be able to go away for like two weeks uh, and your plants would be be fine. So it's, and there's lots of other things you can do, like you can mulch, that's put a layer of, of, of something on the surface. You can use bigger pots. There's lots of things you can do to reduce the frequency, reduce the need of watering. But if you're actually going away for a week, you probably need either an automatic watering system to get a friend um, or to use really big uh, water reservoirs. Brilliant, thank you. Did um, do you, Chris or Mark, have any final thoughts that you want to end on before we wrap up? Well, I, I, personally speaking, I was just really enjoyed the book. I think there's loads of info in it. I think uh, Mark will have more to say in it because he's spent probably a considerable amount of time and effort into it. And I, I congratulate you. And if you want to grow in containers, this is a decent book to go and go and look at without a doubt. Well, OK, so I'll just say I just really hope that, um, you know, I know quite a lot of people listening are already um, very experienced. Some of you are just starting off. If you're just starting off, I just just really hope just give it a go. Just give it a go with an open mind um, and learn as you learn as you go. And yeah, I hope you'll hope you'll really hope you will really get a lot out of it. And for those of you who've more experienced, um, yeah, I, I hope the book will be useful. You know, if you want to create a really productive garden or you want to sort of, as I say, it's not, a, a lot of this is just, it's just stuff, you know, I have learned some of it myself the hard way, but I've just picked up loads of things from actually probably quite a lot of people listening today. <laughs> so it's sort of, uh, and from all over, and I've also talked to like lots of professional growers and stuff like that. So hopefully, you know, even if you're quite experienced, hopefully you'll still find some information in here which is uh, useful for you. And, you know, the learning continues as well. So, you know, do, you know, if you're on, the, on part of a vertical veg Facebook group or whatever, it's always useful if you, you know, if you try something in here, it doesn't work or it works really well, or you find a different way of doing it. Um, then, you know, I just feel this whole thing has been a journey because this sort of growing is actually quite new. You know, I don't think 15, 20 years ago, many people no, they created- weren't, right. Yeah, um, the garden sort of, is new, isn't it, Mark? It's yeah. fairly fresh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I started this vertical veg when my son was born, and he just became a teenager the other day. So <laughs> I feel in a way that container growing 
um obviously it's been growing for years and centuries but i feel <laughs> that this sort of this sort of modern sort of container growing is sort of like into it getting into its teenage sort of yeah <laughs> i'll bet uh, he looks at it um, that way as well mark doesn't he <laughs> yeah so um but yeah so it's an evol ever evolving thing and it's exciting because i mean i'm really i'm really excited by it because i think um i mean sometimes i think i'm a bit mad <laughs> But I actually genuinely think that it has, um, I think that food growing, I mean, not just container growing, but I think that food growing in the city really could be, is really important for us, partly for food security, but partly because I think it's so easy to live life now completely disconnected from the natural world and from where our food comes from and the complex complexities of, of life and things which is which is needed and you know when you start growing you realize that things like wasps and hoverflies and things like that they're they're they're, they're just they're, they're, they're essential for like pollination um for the whole balance of the ecosystem so wasps are really important in terms of hunting out bugs and things and i just think it's like a window through which we can learn um and just feel so much more so much more knowledge about about who we are and where we want to go <laughs> I think that I think that the more growing we have in the city and for the community stuff and everything else, um, I think it's great. So I'm really I'm really keen that this sort. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this book because I'm really keen that this sort of gardening becomes a bigger thing in the future. Here, here. Um, thank you both for such a wonderful evening, and thank you everyone for joining us. Quick final um, request, if you have the book, if you like it, it'd be great if you could leave us a review, um, that really helps. Um, and have a lovely evening, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>